All right, so um, we're going to talk about um, Poisson regression. Um, Poisson regression, it, it is an important um, modeling technique. If you go back to, um, ah, seems so long ago, right? If you go back to that first day's lecture and you look at that survey, right? Remember there was that study, it surveyed the medical literature and looked at the, um, the different statistical techniques that were used in the various um, the various studies, and they made a little histogram, or sorry, a little bar graph out of them. Um, Poisson regression was one of those techniques. It was one of the smaller, shorter bars, so it was there. It made the cuts, but certainly is not as prominently used as um, a Pearson chi-square test um, or logistic regression. Um, that said, I still think it's it's certainly important to be aware of, and um, and then hopefully by the end of this lecture, um, a little bit familiar with, a little bit comfortable with. I'm not going to go into it in the same level of depth as I did logistic regression. Right, we're we're starting to run short on time. Um, we do offer um, an elective course, uh, Categorical Analysis Part 2 or Advanced Categorical Analysis. A class like that would go into, would start out by going a little deeper into Poisson regression. Um, so so I, I do know that there's going to be, I don't know if I call, I don't think there's going to be any holes in this lecture, but, you know, there may be questions that involve like, well, what, there may be a desire in you to go a little deeper into some of this stuff. And, um, you know, there's only so much time in a lecture, and again, I just want to get you exposed, to make you aware, to give you kind of a, a beginner's uh, familiarity with it. You're certainly welcome always to email me deeper questions if you just have that lingering curiosity, of course. Right, we're getting close to graduating. You might even, you know, read our textbook a little bit yourself. That goes a little deeper than what I do in these PowerPoints, and, you know, try some Googling. Um, but, of course, I'm always here as, as sort of your number one reference. So... Poisson regression fits into this um, this larger framework that we can think of or refer to or is referred to as generalized linear models. Um, GLM, but not the not the GLM from uh, from Proc GLM. That's general linear models. This is generalized linear models. They are two different things. Generalized linear models is a higher level of generalization. Um, if you actually go back to, um, if you go back to our first lecture on logistic regression, you'll see that I kind of foreshadow some of what we're going to talk about now when I talk about how we can. Um, change the way we conceptualize STAT 512. It's, it's up to you whether you want to go back and listen to those slides again. Um, but if you wanted to, I'd go back to where I talk about like how we could reconceptualize STAT 512 as, um, as saying, okay, our Y variable follows a normal distribution. A normal distribution has these parameters associated with them, a mean and a variance. And I want to model the mean as this linear combination of explanatory variables. It's sort of that way of thinking is like a generalized linear model way of thinking. So more broadly, a generalized linear model has these three parts to it. It has a random component. My Y follows some distribution, right? A normal distribution, a Bernoulli distribution, and so on. It has a systematic component, and it has a link function. So let's talk about what those three are. Well, we mentioned the random component. The random component just describes the distributional assumptions on our Y variable. The systematic component for us is just going to be what's going on on the right-hand side of our equation, and we're just going to, for now, focus on just that usual linear combination of variables um, along with their associated parameters. And then a link function. So the link function is going to be the function that links the mean of y to that systematic component, to that linear combination of explanatory variables. So in 512, 
we would, what are our three pieces? We would say y follows a normal distribution. What are the parameters of a normal distribution? A, a normal distribution has a mean and a variance, a mu and a sigma squared. Our systematic component is ju just that beta naught plus beta 1x1 plus beta 2x2 and so on. Our link function is what we would call the identity function. So we have just mu itself because the mean of a normal distribution ranges from negative infinity to infinity. And our right hand side, right, that linear combination of explanatory variables also ranges from negative infinity to infinity. So we actually don't really have to do a function of the mean. It could be just the mean itself. Kind of the simplest um, situation. Logistic regression, a little not so simple. Y follows a Bernoulli distribution. Again, a Bernoulli random variable is a random variable that takes only one of two outcomes. Something occurs or something does not occur. Its expected value is pi. Its variance is pi times one minus pi. In our systematic component, linear combination of explanatory variables, and we link the mean to that. So the function of the mean is the log of the mean over 1 minus the mean. Why, right? We talked about that in our in our beginning lecture to logistic regression because that 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 takes the pi, which is the mean, is is stuck its bounds are between 0 and 1. It doesn't match the bounds on the right-hand side. So instead, we have to do the log of pi over 1 minus pi. That does stretch the bounds out so that now the left-hand side, in theory, can go from negative infinity to infinity or, right, is unbounded. And now the bounds of the left and the right match up. Now, what we're going to talk about this week, our new type of model is called a Poisson model. In this situation, y follows not a normal, not a Bernoulli, but a Poisson distribution. We'll talk a little bit about the Poisson distribution in a few slides for those of you that are maybe uh, maybe not familiar with it or maybe for those of you that are a little bit rusty on it. Um, the Poisson distribution, its mean is the same as its variance. That's a quirk of the Poisson distribution. And that is this single parameter, lambda. And so lambda takes the values from 0 to infinity, which means that we can't do lambda equals that eta symbol. We can't do lambda equals that script in looking symbol. Because again, that script in is that, is that linear combination in theory that can go anywhere from negative infinity to infinity. And lambda just goes from 0 to infinity. But taking the log of something that goes from 0 to infinity, that log now goes from negative infinity to infinity. So it's not the logit function, it's the log function. Now the Poisson distribution is a random variable that takes the value 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way to infinity. So, right, the, the positive integers. It's indexed, as we said, by that single parameter lambda, and the mean and variance are, in fact, this parameter lambda. The Poisson random variable is often used in practice to model count data that have no obvious upper limit. So examples might be, you see it a lot, to model things like number of accidents at a treacherous intersection. In fact, I think we did an example using a Poisson random variable earlier in this class, I think probably week two, when we talked about the goodness of fit test for a single variable. Um, it's also used um, in like actuarial contexts to model things like the number of insurance claims filed by a family. You might use it to model number of outbreaks of a disease, number of employees quitting a company, so count data, right? This is not what we would typically think of as categorical, right? It's not a category, it is a number, but also strictly speaking, it's not continuous, right? And so in that sense, like a 512 type model is not, 
is not theoretically appropriate, right? Because, because again, 512 is assuming things like a normal distribution, which are continuous, not something like a number of accidents, which is discrete. You could have one accident, you can have two accidents, you cannot have 1.2 accidents. We also know, right, this is just sort of basic statistical literacy. Um, it's discussed, I think, a little bit in my 512 review lectures, um, which are on YouTube, if you want to check those out. Um, we know that relative frequencies are often more informative than actual raw frequencies. Right, that is, it's more informative to say, right, 30% of a class got an A than it is to say three people in the class got an A. And so with this in mind, we can also, it turns out, if we're smart about it, we can use Poisson regression to model not just counts, what we would talk to refer to as count data, but also to model rates. So, so examples of rates that we might model might be not the number of events, but the number of events per year. Not the number of bacteria, but the number of bacteria per, um, per milliliter of solution. All right, so this is kind of, rates is actually kind of like what? It's providing like this extra level of context on top of our measurement. So let's start with a relatively simple situation. So consider a single explanatory variable x. So we have a model that looks like this. Log lambda is equal to beta naught plus beta 1x. Of course, exponentiating both sides, we would get, right, this is unraveling it just like we, we like to do. Again, we're often interested in lambda, not log lambda. We're working with log lambda just because we sort of have to mathematically. That's what needs to be done. We, we, like, we like using linear combinations of explanatory variables. It's intuitive, it's straightforward, it's easy to model. So that's what we want SAS to model. And so then we have to take the parameter we're interested in, lambda, and tweak it in some way to make it also range from negative infinity to infinity. That tweak puts it in these weird units that are not um, are not necessarily useful to us. And so we have to sort of undo that tweak to get back to our original units, to get back to the actual lambda, the actual mean, which is probably what we'd be interested in really solving for. So we exponentiate both sides, we get to lambda, which is probably what we're interested in. Just like in logistic regression, we were often interested in the actual pi, not the log of pi over one minus pi. We're interested in like, what is pi? What's that, for this set of explanatory variables, what is the predicted probability someone's gonna default? So here, right, what's the predicted mean? What is the predicted, say, mean number of accidents or mean number of insurance claims for some explanatory variable x? It's going to be e to that beta naught times e to that beta 1 times x, which, right, algebraically is the same as e to the beta 1, that quantity raised to the power x. Which means what? It means every time we're incrementing x from 0 to 1 to 2 to 3, Right, we're basically multiplying over and over and over by a factor of e to the beta one. That is, we can think of e to the beta one as the multiplicative effect on the mean for a one unit increase in x. In other words, if x increases by one unit, then we expect there to be an e to the beta one minus one times 100% increase, decrease in the mean of y. So that's for counts. If we want to model rates, not a big deal. It's just instead of modeling y, we're now modeling y over some constant n, which means that our relative expected value is not lambda, but is instead lambda over some constant n. And so we're modeling the log of lambda over n. And so algebraically, if we exponentiate that, 
right? You should be able to see, and if not, you should reach out to me. You should be able to see that that log of lambda over n equal to beta naught plus beta 1x is equivalent to the log of lambda with that extra log n term. That extra log n term is referred to technically as the offset parameter. And then we can exponentiate, we exponentiate, we get that formula right there, which shows us that the mean is proportional to n, right? So, right, the number, the number of people, right, that maybe have some disease is proportional to the size of the county or the size of the city that we're looking at. That makes sense. So let's walk through a let's walk through a romantic example. Um, this is again some interesting, um, somewhat quirky uh, real life example um, published back in 1996. It looked at horseshoe crabs, and so fun fact: uh, when horseshoe crabs mate, one female attracts many males around her nest. And these visiting crabs are known as her satellites. So a female attracts a certain number of satellites. And the goal of the study was to find out um, what female attributes affect the number of satellites. That's kind of cool, right? So what do male horseshoe crabs find attractive in a female horseshoe crab? <laughs> 507 is turning into matchmaking 101. A little bit of a, a more lighthearted example, right? Which is a which is a pleasant change of pace from some of those darker examples. So these are the variables that the uh, researchers considered. So the color of the crab. Um, so uh, kind of rated one, two, three, and four on this kind of sliding scale of light to dark. Uh, they had this spine condition. They measured. Um, I guess if you're a horseshoe crab, you have spines. I think they're kind of like antenna. Um, and so these, these spines, these antenna could both be good. They could both uh, be not good. I think not good means like damaged in some way. And one could be good and one could be damaged. So, you know, I guess the life of a horseshoe crab is a hard life. Um, and so, right, I guess it's, it's common enough to have damaged uh, spines, antennas that... It's something that we're going to record as a as a quality. Um, a carapace width. So that's a fun uh, vocabulary term. You can Google it. I think it essentially just means like the shell. It's just a fancy word for the shell of the crab. And the shell is the crab's carapace. Um, the weight of the crab. And then, of course, our variable of interest, Y, is the number of satellites. Um, as I was writing these PowerPoints, um, satellite's a tough word. I kept forgetting how to spell the word satellite. So, uh, so I used the word suitors, right? So a female horseshoe crab has a certain number of suitors. So I think I kind of personally, I, I transitioned to that word, um, even though I think satellite is the technical term. So, uh, so baby steps, let's, let's start, um, by looking at just a single explanatory variable. Let's start with just width. So here's a new proc for us. So these generalized linear models can be fit with proc gen mod. Proc gen mod has a model statement, just like most of our modeling based procs. We do Poisson regression by doing dist equals Poisson. So that's the distributional assumption. And then link equals log. That's that, that link um, that we need. Just like, just like all of, I think, our model-based assumptions, if we're going to want to do predictions, which I do want to eventually talk about, we have to output those predictions to a data set. So we use the output statement to do that. I'm going to output to a data set called temp, and I'm going to output the predicted values. Keyword for that is P. You have to give it a variable name. I'm going to call it pred1, the predictions for my one variable model. And then proc print to take a look at those. 
Uh, so here's my output. A little bit bare bones. There are bells and whistles you can use to get more refined um, Poisson regression analysis. Again, remember, this is intended just to be like a little introduction um, primer on Poisson regression. I'm not intending to go into a lot of depth with it. Um, but right here's our basic output. Um, in particular, right, we can see um, our model equation. We can see our beta naught. We can see um, our width. We'll talk a little bit at the end of this lecture, just like one or two slides, we'll talk about what's going on with that scale parameter, but for now, let's just ignore it. So again, we have a we have a one variable model with a beta naught and a beta one, or beta naught hat, beta one hat. The width variable is highly significant, indicating that that width is important for helping predict the mean number of satellites for a female horseshoe crab. It's a positive coefficient, which means that the wider, the wider a female horseshoe crab is, the more suitors she can expect to have. Now, can we quantify that? Sure, let's go ahead and do that. So, uh, variable significance and model equation. We already said width is significant with a very, very small p-value, and the estimated equation would look like that, log of lambda hat equals negative 3.3048 plus uh, 0 0.0164. If you wanted to solve for lambda hat, the expected number of suitors, you would just exponentiate both sides of those equations. In fact, that's what I do right here. So what would be our estimate for the mean number of satellites for a female horseshoe crab whose carapace has a width of 25 centimeters. Well, I just plug 25 into my equation and exponentiate it. I do that, I get 2.215. So I would expect that crab to have 2.215 suitors. We can confirm that by looking at our output. Oh man, oh there it is, observation 22. So observation 22, we got lucky. This data set happened to have a crab with a carapace width of 25.0. And I know it's not quite um, what I had, what did I say, 2.215? That's because, um, right, some of the parameter estimates that I plugged in the equation had a little bit of rounding error and SAS used um, a greater degree of precision. Um, and parameter estimates for generating these predictions. So I, they, they're a little bit off with just rounding error. And just like in 512, if 25.0 had not been in my data set, I could have added an extra observation, a, a, a crab number 43, with a width of whatever it is I want to make the prediction for, and a Y variable set to missing. How would I interpret the beta one? Well, again, it's on the log scale. So I can't interpret it, at least not intuitively, not in the context of like a, a unit we're interested in, just by itself. I would instead interpret it exponentiated. So I exponentiate that, I get 1.178. That's basically saying for every extra centimeter of width, we would expect a female horseshoe crab's uh, mean number of suitors, or actually I guess I should say expect um, the female horseshoe crab's number of suitors to increase by 17.8%. Yeah, straightforward enough, hopefully. Well, let's look at the output when all of the variables are in the model now. So here we are, here's an equation with everything in it. Now we could get into like nuts and bolts, right? There's all those things, we could write our model equation, we could talk about dummy variables, we could like exponentiate and interpret. I want us to, again, I want us to try to take a, a different tact and talk about this maybe a little bit more, um, I don't know, I guess maybe conversationally the way we might talk to a non-statistician without intimidating the heck out of them. 
So how might we do that? Well, let's kind of go through these variables one at a time. So I look at weight. The weight variable is significant. Its coefficient is positive. So the message I would communicate to a non-statistician is, yeah, weight is important. It's an important factor to male horseshoe crabs. It turns out the more a female horseshoe crab weighs, the more attractive she is, or, right, more technically, the, uh, the more suitors, the more satellites she can expect to have. Width is not significant. What the cut the? How can that be? How could it be that when we looked at width just a few slides back, it was highly significant, and now it's not significant? What's going on? What's all this fickle fackle? Oh, that's right. These are type 3 p-values. The previous analysis was looking at width by itself. But this is asking the question, does width add anything above and beyond all other variables in our model? My guess is, in this case, we have two variables, weight and width which are both kind of measuring the same abstract concept, which is the size, right? The size of that, of that horseshoe crab. And what we're maybe seeing is that we just need one variable to measure size. Width does well, if that's all we have, but weight seems to do better. If we have weight, then, then, then width is no longer important or no longer necessary. We have the color. Now, again, this is done in terms of reference categories. So SAS, by default, we can see picked four as the reference category. That's the darkest color. Notice like this very, very nice trend in terms of like those parameter estimates for one, two, and three are deviations from four. So look at that. It looks like as we're going from four to one, like those parameter estimates are increasing. And then not surprisingly, the p-values are increasing. So um, what do we see? We see that it looks like, looks like color one is the only one significantly different than color four. And so what is that basically saying? It's saying that it appears that, um, that having a lighter color is preferable in terms of attracting suitors. And then we see that spine, the reference category is category three. It appears that the categories one and two aren't significantly different than category three. So spine is maybe not important in terms of how many, um, how many satellites we would expect a female horseshoe crab to pick. Right, does that make sense? So we're basically saying what's important? Weight is important and color is important. To be honest, right, not to, uh, not to simplify the mating preferences of horseshoe crabs, I'm actually guessing that what's important is just being noticed. That the more noticeable you are as a female horseshoe crab, the more male horseshoe crabs you could expect to be interested in you. Um, and so being larger is important, and maybe the best way to measure that idea of largeness is weight. And I don't know, maybe horseshoe crabs hang out in a dark environment, and so a lighter color gives a greater degree of contrast. It's my guess. Um, I'm certainly, I am a bit, not to brag, I am a bit of an expert when it comes to bears, maybe less so when it comes to horseshoe crabs. It is kind of cool, though, isn't it, that every one of our classes we learn a little something interesting about the... Uh, about the um, the wild world that we live in. Oh man, speaking of wild worlds that we live in, if you want something really fun, oh man, why don't you go to YouTube and search for, um, oh, for YouTube sensation, Coyote Peterson. Oh, you'll thank me. Um, oh, what's his, uh, what's his motto? His motto is what I say to myself now every morning when I wake up. Be brave, stay wild. Ah, oh, I love it. And of course, right here's some aggregate um, things. I don't know. SAS actually, I feel probably should put this output. Well, I think I had to ask for it, but um, right, it would be nice to have this output before the model equation. And this this does agree though with what we said, right? Weight is significant, width is not, color is significant, spine is not.
So here's just a summary of those big picture observations that kind of kind of what I had already talked through. All right, so that was a kind of fun example um, of, of using Poisson regression to model count data. Now let's see how we could use it to model um, rates. So again, this is data from a real life study um, that was used to um, look at melanoma incidence rates, right? So the number of cases of melanoma, I think melanoma is like a type of skin cancer. Um, so the number of melanoma, but out of a certain number of people. In particular, the study looked at white males in different regions of the country. The different regions are just north and south. And they looked at six different age groups. And they were interested in the incidence per population. So, right, a certain number had it out of a certain number that were looked at. This number that were looked at is the population. So there's our data set if you want to play around with it. So we can see our age groups, 35 to 44, 45 to 54. There's uh, the number that had it, so that's uh, 75. That's what we call the cases, and the total, that's the population size. So, right, we can see it's relatively rare, thankfully, only 75 out of 220,407 white males aged 35 to 44 from the south. Now notice, remember, when we're modeling rates, remember we had that offset parameter. That offset parameter was that log n, the log of the total. Now we're gonna have to create that variable ourselves. Quirk of SAS. Not a big deal, we could do it in the data step. So, right, I'm not inputting it, but, but notice in that data step, or in that data statement, there's an extra step where I create L total, the log total. It needs to be on the log scale. And it's the log of N. It's the log of that total. So there's proc gen mod. I can use my class statements just like before. I can use reference coding, set it up just like before. I can use my model equation. I could do the type three statement to get those uh, type three tests for the variables. And then if I, if I want to model rates, I communicate that to SAS by telling it I want to use an offset parameter. And then I have, that has to be a variable in my data set. So it's the L total data set or L total variable that we created earlier. So yeah, so offset statement. Using the offset statement models the log incidence rates. Note that we need to input our total value into the model as a log. So as we've already said. Here's our output. Um, again, if I think we'll see in the next slide that um, like a significance test just for age and just for region, but both of those will be highly significant. Looking at the model equation, what are the big picture observations? We can see our reference category was youngsters, those aged less than 35. Notice we see a very nice, very, um, very clear trend. As we move away from, from that, that young category, our parameter estimates increase. Notice they're all significantly different than that less than 35 category. So what is that saying big picture? Positive coefficients. So it's saying that as we get older, the expected incidence rate for melanoma is increasing. Look at region. Our, um, our reference category is north because, hey, we live in the north. So that's the way, that's our viewpoint we're looking out from. And it looks like Southerners, relative to us, have a positive coefficient. So that means they have a higher expected um, incidence rate of melanoma. Those are the big picture observations. We'll talk about maybe some ways of quantifying. Okay, when you say they have a higher incidence rate, how much higher? We'll talk about quantifying that in just a second. 
Yeah, so there's our um, significance tests of variables. Again, right, the, 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 the kind of abstract variable age is really technically five variables since it has six categories. So realistically, I would look at this first and then the model equation second, even though SAS outputs it in that opposite order. So yeah, all age categories are significant relative to the reference category of youngster. Positive coefficient. We're back to uh, we're back to uh, depressing examples, right? Yeah, skin cancer. Oh sure, go have fun. Go go to the beach, enjoy yourself. Yeah, you only get skin cancer. Oh, you want to go to the south, visit Texas, go have fun in Florida? Oh yeah, well enjoy yourself having melanoma. Um, yeah, yeah. So that's that's everything I think we said in the previous slide. And then we can interpret. So if I say that you're more likely to have melanoma if you're in the 50 or the 45 to 54 age category, you might say how much more likely? Well, that's where you could go to the model equation, get the 1.91, just like in logistic regression, we could exponentiate it to get 6.774. So we would say that the estimated rate of incidence of melanoma for white males uh, 45 to 54, 6.774 times that of those who are 35 or less. All other variables held constant, so assuming they're from the same region. All right. Um, so I, I, I want to, um, it, it's hard to really go in depth with this without creating like a whole extra week of material. And again, my goal is just to make us sort of familiar with this. But I do want to talk about a term that you might see used um, fairly frequently when talking about Poisson models. It's sort of part of like Poisson, like maybe diagnostics, which again, if we, if we had a second semester, this would be something we could dive deeper into. Um, it's not so much that the diagnostics are hard, but the remedies would take some, some work and certainly at least one extra lecture, maybe even two extra lectures. So again, I'm just going to, I'm just going to mention it. Um, but, but recall the Poisson random variable, the mean is equal to the variance. So if we're modeling something with a Poisson random variable, that means that we're, we're, we're sort of assuming that the mean and the variance are the same. And of course that may or may not be consistent with what's going on in our data. When this is not true, when this assumption is violated, we say that our data has over dispersion. Over dispersion is primarily an issue with log models, but can also be an issue with logit models as well. How do we look for over dispersion? What's the red flag? Well, we usually look at the ratio of the deviance test statistic to the degrees of freedom or the Pearson test statistic to degrees of freedom. If you go back to our output, you'll see that both of those are reported in our output. This could be essentially interpreted as the ratio of the variance to the mean. That, that deviance test statistic we can think of as an estimate of the variance, the degrees of freedom we can think of as an estimate of the mean. Now we want the mean and the variance to be equal to each other for a Poisson model to be appropriate. And so we want that ratio to be close to one. So when it's close to one, then we say that there is not evidence. And of course, the farther from one, the greater the evidence. Just big picture. What would we do if there's over dispersion? We could try a different model. So for example, the negative binomial model, which again, you may or may not be familiar with from step 505, but the important thing about the negative binomial model is that it has two parameters or it's, it's indexed by two parameters, right? That's the problem we're running into. The Poisson model, right, we have two sort of characteristics, a mean and a variance, but we have only one parameter, which is lambda. So we're trying to use one parameter to model two things. 
Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. When it doesn't, then we try a random variable that has two parameters. That will give us greater flexibility in a situation with data where the mean and the variance are differing. We can also rescale. And so we rescale by applying this multiplicative factor. We can do that using the scale equals option. And so like, for example, I believe you could do scale equals Pearson or uh, scale equals deviance. And it will force that, that ratio, it'll force that ratio, it'll scale the data in a way that forces it to be equal to exactly one. And I think this is the last slide. Um, and so I want to say to you, as we wrap things up, and uh, until I see you next week, be brave, stay wild. <laughs>